Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise Allah and we ask Allah for guidance and for forgiveness. And we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our own actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one could lead them astray. And whomsoever Allah makes astray, no one can lead them back to, this right, to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah alone, having no associates. And I bear witness that Muhammad is a servant and messenger of Allah. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you, forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger <clears throat> will tru truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. Alhamdulillah, we are all here together on this blessed Friday. You know, all too often, um, I can speak for myself, I take for granted <clears throat> that we'll see each other again on Friday. Um, and I forget to thank Allah for this opportunity to gather in this awesome virtual space um, and to be able to see each other despite being miles and miles apart and to be fortunate enough to live and exist in such a time of modern marble. Now, I've been thinking um, a lot lately about our physical existence and our purpose in life. And I try to keep these thoughts in the forefront of my mind, but sometimes it takes a trigger to really spend time contemplating and focusing on this. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't um, say that this recent jolt was unfortunate um, because Allah is the best of planners, but it is surely um, a bolt coupled with sadness. So I, I mentioned last week in our post khutbah chat that um, two weekends ago, I attended the funeral of my cousin's wife, Zaina, and her passing was a stark reminder of the fragility of life. So she and I were the same age and our children are the same age, um, but the similarities pretty much stop there because never in my life have I met a more unique, content, selfless, and God-conscious uh, centered person as Zaina. A few days after the funeral, I um, saw some photos of her that were taken just the night before she passed away. Um, and I hadn't seen her in person since uh, the summer. But to say she was unrecognizable is really an understatement. I, I don't think I've seen someone um, that close to death who was, you know, my age. Uh, she looked like she was 30 years older than she really was. She looked sick. She looked physically defeated. And even despite that, her ever radiant smile and, and the twinkle in her eye, she just didn't look like the person I knew. And I was lamenting on this, um, this change, this just such, such a drastic shift in her physical appearance. And Omar reminded me um, that her body is, is just merely a vessel. It wasn't her or who she was. And I was reminded that our bodies are not ours. They are entrusted to us by Allah, but it is Allah whom our bodies belong to. Who she was and what she was really was her nafs. Uh, and there are many ways to understand and translate what the nafs actually is. And I wanna spend some time kind of exploring and, and defining our nafs before highlighting how the individual nafs interact. Because if we wanna grow spiritually and improve our character and actions, we need to first understand the various factors affecting the internal state of our hearts. <clears throat> now, most scholars define our nafs as our self, our psyche, or our ego, and even some go as far as saying it's our soul. Um, another way that the nafs has been used in the Quran, which is quite frequent, is that the nafs is referring to a specific part of ourself, um, and that it is that part of ourself that has desires and appetite. Some people call it ego. As I mentioned, it has anger, it has passion, it has lust, desire, it has all of these things. Um, some people may even call it like a carnal self or the carnal soul. But bear in mind that the nafs is not part of the ruh, the spirit. It's, the nafs is part of the physical human being. So if we wanted to say that we have some physical part of our creation, that is our body and our nafs, but then Allah has also put inside ourselves an inner spiritual part of our creation. That's our ruh. So the nafs is part of our physical self, even though it's not part of our physical body. So it's a little, um, a little confusing. I think so many scholars have tried to really define it. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper. 
And just as a note, in the Quran, nafs is mentioned 295 times as a noun, and then an additional three mentions in different forms. So the noun nafs has important instances in the Quran, such as the following, quote, you who believe you are responsible for your own souls. If anyone else goes astray, it will not harm you so long as you follow the guidance. You will all return to God and he will make you realize what you have done. That's in Surah um, Ma'ida, verse 105. Uh, and the major theme of the, the word nafs as used here is to instill a sense of individual responsibility and um, through a strong emphasis on the choices made by the individual, while at the same time reminding humanity of its common origins, which can be found in the opening verse of Surah Al-Nisat. O people, be mindful of your Lord who created you from a single soul and from it it's created its mate. And from the pair of them spread countless men and women far and wide, far and wide. Be mindful of God, in whose name you make requests of one another. Before, but beware of severing the ties of kinship. God is always watching over you. So again, <clears throat> that you have the nefs that is individual, that is um, aware of right and wrong. And then you have the kind of the communal nefs that we all came from a nefs. The Quran itself doesn't attribute to the nefs any inherent properties of good or evil, but instead conveys the idea that it is something which has to be nurtured and self-regulated so that it can progress into becoming good and inwardly meaningful through its thoughts and actions. There is, however, a Sufi concept of understanding the nefs, nefs as three principal stages. So the first is the nefs al-umara, the inciting nefs, or the nefs that is ruling over the self. In its primitive stage, the nefs incites people to commit evil. This is the nefs of the lower self or the basic instincts. In Surah Yusuf in the Quran, Yusuf says, quote, I do not pretend to be blameless for man's very soul incites him to evil unless my Lord shows mercy. He is most forgiving, merciful. Uh, and so, th so this means that the nefs commands us and tells us what to do. So when the nefs has any desire, any wish, any appetite, or simply commands us, it dominates us. It is that nefs which is sovereign over a human being. It has a sovereignty over us. What it means is that the nefs, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. So we are basically subordinate to that, to that nefs, that lowest level, that lowest stage or principle of the nefs. And it is this first type of nefs um, and the sign. So this is the first type of nefs and the sign that a person has this type of nefs. That's a really weird sentence. So basically what it's saying is that this is how we sin. And we sin, sin willingly if we're at that lowest level of nefs. Uh, and so then there's a second stage of nefs. This is the self-accusing nefs. In Surah Al-Qiyamah, the Quran mentions the self-accusing nefs. This is the stage where the conscious is awakened and the self accuses one for listening to one's ego. One repents and asks forgiveness. So here the nefs is inspired by one's heart, see the results of one's actions, agrees with one's brains, sees one's weakness and aspires to perfection. So you have the first stage, which is um, basically being ruled by your nefs, by your ego. And the second stage, you become aware of that and you start to acknowledge um, sins and you will ask for forgiveness and repent and strive to be better. Um, so this is where you would feel remorse or regret, feel guilt, feel shame or embarrassment. Um, this is where uh, someone wished they could take it back, wish they never did it. I'm just skipping over some of this. So then you would, you would then the third stage, or <clears throat> it, many see it as sort of the final stage, um, is the, the nefs at peace. In Surah Al-Fajr, verses 28, 27 and 28, the Quran mentions to, to the righteous, O oh soul, at peace, return to your Lord, well-pleased and well-pleasing. This is the ideal stage of ego for Muslims. On this level, one is firm in one's faith and leaves bad manners behind. The soul becomes tranquil at peace. At this stage, a person has the ability to be relieved of all materialism and worldly problems and is satisfied with the will of God. Now, to me, this is the stage that I believe Zaina strive to reach and triumphantly attained in the years and months leading to her passing. 
And nor even think that she consciously set that as a goal, but rather achieved it by centering her connection to Allah, wholeheartedly trusting Allah's plan and fully embracing it. I don't imagine that one faces death with such eagerness, but, but Zaina did. Um, and, and I share this about her because she was such a unique person. And I think that I certainly, you know, having known her, um, learned quite a bit. And I, and I wish to share some of those elements that she carried with you all. Um, you know, when she got sick, she was almost elated knowing that her time to meet her maker was near. <clears throat> and I had heard a story that when she thought that her boys would be deprived of her physical presence, you know, she was obviously saddened by that. But then she remembered that as much as she loved her children, Allah loved them more. And that remembrance brought her peace. I can only speak for myself, but that is a type of contentment that I am personally far from reaching, but I am inspired by her to get there. I share this story so that you too may be inspired to either reach that level of taqwa or maintain it if you already have it. I say these words of mine and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala Rasulullah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all mankind. And I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad. So <clears throat> I really hope that that explanation of our nafs wasn't redundant or too simplistic or too vague. Um, I, I actually really enjoyed doing the brief research and I learned a lot. Now I just want to briefly delve into how we can hone our nafs and recognize the quality of the nafs of others, both as an effort to connect to each other and to connect to Allah. So just as a reminder, the three principal stages of nafs are the inciting nafs, the self-accusing nafs, and the nafs at peace. And sometimes four other stages are also mentioned, um, they being the inspired nafs, which is situated between stages two and three, uh, the please nefs, that's after stage three, the pleasing nefs, and the pure nefs. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I, I highly recommend um, looking into this because I, I was quite fascinated at just learning about these different levels and stages that have been um, described. So coincidentally, um, I found out that today is the anniversary of Rumi's, the poet Rumi, um, his soul returning to God. Um, and so often, you know, we turn to Rumi's writing because it's centered on love and the love that he believed infuses the world. But I think that um, that, that love is often hidden by the nefs of the lowest stages, the lowest uh, stage. So I guess my question is, what if, if by, if by elevating and curating our, nef, our nefs to a higher stage, um, we could also unearth the love that exists all around us? or rather by applying, applying love, we can elevate and curate our nafs and the nafs of others. So by, you know, we can, we can hone our nafs to increase the love and we can increase the love to hone our nafs. Like the, it's like this, they feed off of one another. And Rumi had a poem called Love Seeds. And in it, he says, we've got nothing to do except for love. Let's make a vow, you and I, except for love, and more love. Let's plant no seeds in the pure soil of our heart. So could you imagine what would happen if instead of seeing one another as the body in which we occupy in our worldly existence, we saw each other for the nefs we were? Would we not seek out those who have attained a pure nefs? Would we avoid closeness with the inciting nefs? Would we recognize and see who we really are based on our own nafs. How would we treat others if we succumb to the notion that our nafs have no race, no ethnicity, no gender, no age, no wealth? If your nafs is at a lower stage, what would you do to try and elevate it? Would you not look towards someone of an elevated stage and try to emulate or attain that? If your nafs is at a higher stage, would you not welcome the company of a nafs in a lower stage because you know that their incitement will not affect you? And this is a lot of rhetorical questions to pose, but I do so for the incitement of contemplation. <clears throat> I would argue that through love, 
we can not only elevate our own nafs, but also the, the nafs of others, all of which would lead to a deeper love of Allah. And is that not what the goal should be? <clears throat> Excuse me. So two days ago, um, we lost the author, professor, and activist, Bell Hooks. And I'll be the first to admit, I had no idea who she was until she passed. But wow, what a deep and insightful intellectual she was. Bell Hooks spoke and wrote about love quite a bit and believed that a love-centered movement could have an effective and sustainable change. Uh, in the year 2000, she spoke on the life-changing power of love. That is, the act of loving and how love is far broader than, than the romantic sentiment. I'm she said, quote, I'm talking about a love that is transformative, that challenges us, both our private and our civic lives. Um, and she went on to say that she was so moved. She said, quote, I'm so moved often when I think of the civil rights movement because I see it as a great movement for social justice that was rooted in love and that politicized the notion of love that said, real love will change you, end quote. And she also stated uh, that the standard definition of love must include spiritual growth for oneself and others. So there is a caveat. How can we love others if we don't love ourselves? And so self-love is a real element that cannot be neglected. It doesn't mean that we love everything about us, uh, even in areas we are deficient in, but rather we love ourselves in spite of our deficiencies. It means that we identify elements of ourselves that need improvement or we are displeased with and seek ways to better them. It means being honest with yourself and seeking the help of Allah to improve yourself. At times, that may also mean seeking the help or influence of others that Allah has put in your life. Bell Hooks also spoke on the importance of self-love and how to love yourself. She said, one of the best guides on how to be self-loving is to give ourselves a love we often are dreaming about receiving from others. You can never love anybody if you are unable to love yourself. Do not expect to receive the love from someone else you do not give, you do not give yourself. And I will add that if you're struggling to love yourself, remember that Allah's love is ever present. It only takes the remembrance of it to see it and embrace it. And so my sister and sisters and brothers, I hope that you will vow with me to plant no seeds in the pure soil of our heart, except for love. And I pray that by sharing this virtual space and inshallah, a physical space again, our nafs are stretching up to grasp at a higher level of purity and peace. And by spending this time remembering Allah, our nafs are letting go of worldly matters. I pray that the love we have for each other grows for the sake of Allah, and that the love that is infused in our world emerges and takes over the elements that hinder our nafs, the elements of pride, greed, jealousy, lust, backbiting, stinginess, and malice. O oh Allah, please accept our good deeds, forgive our shortcomings and missteps, and allow us to experience much more love together. O Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the hellfire. O Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome and challenge any challenge we may face. O Allah, we hope for your mercy and do not leave us to ourselves even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego. And I ask for forgiveness from that transgression. I mean. <clears throat>